we have been looking at a study on whether or not, uh, well, are you sure that you're saved? And while some uh, don't particularly care in answering such a question, some will become offended. Some simply, uh, well, they don't know. They hope so. Others uh, say, well, we won't really know until the judgment. The Bible teaches that we can know that we're saved. And John, uh, the first epistle of John, to a great extent, is a test on the assurance that we can have of our salvation and of our eternal life. And we can know that, first off, because we know that Jesus has come that second person of the Godhead. He was seen by, wit <coughs> by witnesses. He came as the Lamb of God, which was going to take away the sins of the world for the express purpose of giving his life upon Calvary's tree to be a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world, and thus to shed his blood on Calvary's tree to be that propitiation. <clears throat> and then he was proved to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead, Romans 1 and verse 4. But John also affirms that we can know that we have eternal life because we keep the commandments. We see the motive is because we love him. And that's because he first loved us. But in that obedience to that gospel, we must obey God's plan for man's salvation. And certainly, as 1 John points out, obedience is necessary. We must obey. And in that obedience, it takes our belief, our repenting, our confessing of, our, of Jesus as the Son of God, and then being baptized in water into Christ for the remission of our sins but then we must live in continued obedience to God, remaining faithful to His Word, studying the Scriptures, applying those Scriptures to our life, continuing to confess our sins, then He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, chapter 1 and verse 9. <clears throat> but then we also can know because we are separated from the world. The love of the world is spiritual adultery. John would write in 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17, to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, are of the world. Is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that uh, doeth the will of God, abideth forever. By the way, that last phrase there, he that doeth the will of God, abideth forever, that's continuing to remain faithful to the gospel, to that those laws that God has set forth for us. And by doing so, we abide forever. We have eternal life. What? based upon our obedience to God's will, doing the will of God. But in set off in opposition to that is the love of the world. And if you love the world, then the love of God's not in you. You have a contrast that is set forth. You either love God or you love the world. Now, if you love God, you're not going to love the world. If you love the world, you don't love God. It's that clear for us as John sets forth. And thus, a love of the world, when we love the world, we are committing spiritual adultery. And that's what James would point out in James 4 and verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whoso therefore will be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. The, I believe the American standard leaves out adulterers and just calls them adulteresses. 
and that's based on a textual variation, but uh, it really doesn't make any difference. He's setting forth, you're committing spiritual adultery by having being the friend of the world or loving the world because we are married to Christ. Turn back over to Romans, the seventh chapter, for a minute. And I realize this seventh chapter is dealing with being made free from the law of Moses. But he uses an illustration of the marriage relationship to begin the chapter. And he says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of, the, of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Let me, uh, again, emphasize that Paul is discussing our freedom from the law of Moses in this section. And when he says in verse uh, 5 there, for when we were in the flesh, He's using the flesh within this context as being within the law of Moses. So when you were in that law of Moses, the motions of sin, which were by the law, the law of Moses, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. The law of Moses could not save anyone. The blood of bulls and goats that they shed from the very beginning of time all down through the ages <coughs> could not save anyone from their sins. It could not wash away their sins. That could only come through Jesus Christ. But he makes a comparison of the marriage relationship that here's a woman married to a man. If while that man lives she goes and marries someone else, she is an adulteress. Why? Because she's married to the first man, and she is committing adultery against him. Now then, that first would be the law of Moses. That law of Moses died so that they could be, and we can be, married to Christ. But while we are married to Christ now, there would be that same application that if we go and marry someone else, we would be called an adulteress because we're married to Christ. Thus, if we, going back to 1 John 2 and verse 15 through 17, that if we love the world, then what are we doing? We are committing spiritual adultery because we're married to Christ and we're supposed to love God as a result. Love Christ. That should be preeminent within our life and not have a love of the world because those things are at odds one with another. You cannot be married to both. And yet, how many times do we try to love the things of this world, be the friend of this world, and yet still retain our Christianity. And John and James are saying that's an impossibility. And because of this principle that we see here in Romans 7th chapter, we're married to Christ. If we love the world or we're the friend of the world, then we're committing that spiritual adultery against God and against Christ because we're married to him. 
thus we have to live separated from the world. John would encourage us thus to overcome the world. In chapter 5 and verse 19 of First John, he says that we know that we are God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. Here's the state of the world. They are in wickedness. Why? Because they are living according to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. In that chapter 2 and verse 15 through 17 again. So they, that's where they exist. They exist in that world of wickedness. Go back a few verses though here in chapter 5 to verse 5. And it says, Who is he that overcometh the world? but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. You see, that part of belief there, believing that Jesus is the Son of God, is an affirmation of not simply a mental acknowledgement that God is and that Jesus is God's Son, but it is a living type of faith that is obedient to God's will. It embraces the entirety of the Christian life. He believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Being the Son of God, he, we are giving him that due that is his. We are recognizing his lordship and his kingship of our life. We are going to live according to his will and what he sets forth. That's the individual who overcomes the world that world that's lying in wickedness. And what are they going to do? They're going to overcome that wickedness. They're going to overcome that lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And they're going to be following after that one whom they believe in, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And they're going to be living thus according to his will and his way. Notice, it's not some direct action that God takes upon our life. We're getting more and more people today who are, are going to that, it's actually a Wesleyan view, a lot of people miss, call it Calvinism, it's not technically Calvinistic. But they believe that after one becomes a Christian that the Holy Spirit comes into their heart and directly helps them in overcoming sin. No, the person overcomes sin himself. The person makes a decision. I'm not going to succumb to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. I'm going to overcome that. I'm going to live above it. I'm going to live with Jesus as the Lord of my life. I'm going to believe in him as truly what he is and all that that involves. That's the one who is overcoming the world. But it's not a direct action of the Holy Spirit upon the heart to enable us or empower us or to help us in some way in overcoming sin within our life. We have to do that. It's based upon our own personal responsibility and our own personal action. It's sad to say we have many within the Lord's church today who are taken in by this idea of a direct action of the Holy Spirit upon the heart of the Christian. And it's just not so. The Spirit works through the Word of God. And the Word of God lets us know what God wants Revealed within the pages of the New Testament for us. And what, the, what wickedness is. And it sets forth, here is your choice. Love God or love the world? Be the friend of God or the friend of the world? Now if you claim to be a Christian, then you're married to Christ. Being the friend of the world, you're committing spiritual adultery. Loving the world, you're committing spiritual adultery. 
Thus, we have that obligation. The Spirit's not going to work and help us to overcome that sin. We have to overcome it. And thus, realizing that the world lies in wickedness, we need to recognize that we as Christians are called out of the world. In, as Paul would write to the Colossian brethren, Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, he says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Now, did you notice in our discussion and what we're are you sure you're saved? Do you have eternal life? Do you know that you have eternal life? Look at what he says there in verse 12 there. That we give thanks unto God, which hath made us meet to be partakers of what? The inheritance of the saints in light. The inheritance of the saints, that's eternal life. And so he's dealing with the eternal life that we as Christians possess. And it says we have been delivered out of the power of darkness into, been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. So in overcoming sin and overcoming the world, we are being called out of that one situation into the kingdom of God's dear son. Out of the power of darkness, out of the power of sin, Sin no longer rules in our life, but we're going to now rule over sin. The idea of kingship, we are kings. Yes, we are kings. We are ruling and we're reigning if we're Christians. The problem is when we allow that world to come over, come back in and to rule over us. To allow the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life to take control of our life. We're no longer ruling over those things. They are ruling over us. But the Christian is the one who has been called out of that power of darkness. And he has been called into the kingdom of God's dear son. In 1 Peter, the second chapter, verse 9. Peter would say that you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. <clears throat> Notice, we have been called out of darkness. That's the same thing as what Paul said there in uh, Colossians 1 verse 13. Delivered from the power of darkness and then translated into the kingdom of his dear son. We've been called out of darkness into light. And what does light represent? If you go back to 1 John 1 and verse 5, light represents God. That God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And thus that which God represents, all that God represents, his attributes, his attitudes, his characteristics, that's what the Christian takes on. That's what the Christian is. And he's not living like the world and allowing the world to take control of his life. He's been called out of that power of darkness. Darkness being sin. Or the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's that darkness where we've been called out of that darkness into the marvelous light of God. And as a result, we're that chosen generation. And the idea of chosen there, God has chosen us, but how? He's chosen us in Christ. Thus, in becoming a Christian, we get into Christ. What is it? We're married to him. We're a royal priesthood. The priest offers gifts and sacrifices. We offer gifts and sacrifices, but ours is a spiritual gifts. 
Hebrews 13, verses 13 and 14, or uh, uh, 13 and 14, that by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifices of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name, but to do good and to communicate for with, forget not, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. There's the sacrifices of the, of the Christian. It is the fruit of our lips. It is doing good. It is that aspect of communication. The word communication there is a word which is elsewhere translated fellowship. We have fellowship with those individuals who are doing right. We withdraw our fellowship from those in the world. We do not fellowship the world. We're not the friend of the world. We don't love the world. Thus, we don't fellowship the world. But we have fellowship with those who are right and doing right. Thus, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Uh, this nation, the United States, people used to say it's a Christian nation. It was never a Christian nation, never has been, never will be. There's one Christian nation, and that nation is the church. The church of Christ is that Christian nation. It's that holy nation. It's that nation that God has set apart to be dedicated and consecrated to Him. Not profaning itself with the things of the world. The idea of profane is the idea of being set apart from the temple. Set apart from the services of the temple. And thus to take something that was dedicated and consecrated to the temple and use those things for common usages. That was profaning it. We're not profane. We have been dedicated and consecrated as a Christian people to God. To live his way. And yes, in living his way, to overcome the world and the things of the world. Now why? Because we've been called out of that darkness. We've been called out of that world to be that holy nation. To be that peculiar people. The word peculiar. An interesting word. Literally, it's belonging to and the idea is presented if I uh, had a blackboard up here and drew two circles and put a dot in one of the circles, that dot would be peculiar to that circle, but it's not to the other circle. It has nothing to do with the other circle. Where that dot, God is that circle, and the world is the other circle. We have nothing to do with the world. We're not... Yes, we live in the world, but we have nothing to do with the world. We're not of the world. We are of God. We belong to Him. And thus we are peculiar to Him. And not to anything else or anyone else. And in doing so, living that type of lifestyle, we're called out of darkness into His marvelous light. The way in which we're called is by the gospel of Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that it's to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's eternal life that we're dealing with. Are you sure you're saved? Well, if you're called by the gospel, you're called to eternal life. You're being called to that, obtaining that glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. But you're being called out of the world into the light of God. And thus, the world no longer sets the standard for the Christian. But for a lot of those who profess Christianity, sad to say the world is still setting their standards. But the difference is the one who is a Christian, the one who has truly been called out of darkness into his marvelous light, the one who truly has eternal life, 
no longer is living by the standard of the world. He is living by the standard of God. That's going to be seen in the way in which we dress. Are we going to allow the world to set our standard? Or are we going to allow God to set our standard? Now, yes, God sets a standard for the way in which we are to dress. We are to dress in modest apparel. We are not to be, from a biblical standpoint, naked. And why I say that way is because God does tell us what nakedness is. He starts from the very beginning of time telling us what nakedness is. When Adam and Eve sinned, they clothed themselves, and I use that accommodatively, with fig leaves, covering what, uh, probably covering themselves more than a lot of the modern day swimsuits today cover. And yet, even using those fig leaves to cover themselves, they recognized they were still naked. And God recognized they were naked. And so he slew an animal. And he covered their nakedness. But what did he give them? He gave them garments of clothing that covered from their shoulders to the knees. Why did he do that? Because he was covering their nakedness. Thus we start learning from the very beginning of time. If you uncover that area, then you are by God considered naked. That means men as well as women. These men who get out and whether it's on the basketball court and they're going to start playing basketball or they get out on the, some athletic event and they take their shirts off, they are exposing their nakedness. They are sinning. Or they're at work and it's hot and sweaty and so they take shirt off. They're exposing their nakedness and they sin. When women start wearing low-cut dresses, or allowing the hymns to come up above the knee, then they're exposing their nakedness. Now, what standard are we going to live by? Are we going to live by the standard of the world, or are we going to live by the standard of God? That's really where it comes down to in relationship to our clothing. Which standard will we go by? Will we go by God's standard and, ex and not expose our nakedness and thus dress in a modest way? Or will we follow the standard of Hollywood and society and those ungodly people that design clothing in our society today and follow their lead in exposing our nakedness? For the Christian, is going to follow God's standard. In our entertainment, and what we find entertaining, are we going to go by the standard of the world or by the standard of God? Will we hold up that entertainment and that type of entertainment, that form of entertainment that is pleasing to God, or the way that the world looks at it? You see, the Christian's different. The Christian has been called out of the world. He's not like the world any longer. But as far as so many, they're just like the world. What about our speech? Is our speech the same thing as the world's? Or is it different from the world? Do we use the same vile, base, uncouth, rude language that the world uses? uses those terms and those phrases that have double entendre meanings? Or is our speech with truth seasoned with salt that it might build up and edify people? Do we go by the standard of the world or do we go by the standard of God in the way in which we speak? The morality that we see in our society, 
and what we consider moral today and what we consider immoral if and some don't even consider anything immoral. Where is our morality? Where is our standard of morality? Is it based upon God and His will, or is it based upon the world's standard of morality? If they even have a standard. And that's really not a good term because they don't have a standard. That's the problem. But the world has a morality that is immoral, ungodly. They see nothing wrong with shacking up together and living together. They see nothing wrong with the impure speech, with the ungodly dress, and on and on. They see nothing wrong with stealing a little bit here and there. They see... In fact, uh, some of our greatest stories of the past. Robin Hood, great hero, isn't he? What was it? He was a thief. But wait a minute, he stole from the rich and gave to the poor, so he's a hero, right? No, he was a thief. Now what standard are we going to go by? Are we going to go by man's or are we going to go by God's? You see... Uh, the world is constantly trying to pull us down to its level. It does it in various ways. Going back to entertainment, for example. How many of us remember All in the Family and that TV show? But did you realize that it was teaching us a lesson of morality? But it was not the morals that God would uphold. It was the morals of the world. And it was done in order to ridicule Christianity. Now, let me ask, which one would you rather be? Would you rather be the intellectual who is kind and considerate to others? Or would you rather be a bigot who was rude and crude I just tried and very quickly to portray, well, Archie Bunker, the rude, bigoted individual who believed in God and who he called a meathead, who is an atheist, who is kind and considerate of others. Now, which one would you rather be? You see, they presented a view of Christianity which was not right in order to get people to abandon Christianity. Think of MASH. And the ungodly priest, bumbling idiot, as opposed to the intellectuals who did not believe in God. Now, which one do you want to be, a bumbling idiot or the one who is an intellectual? You see, our entertainment was designed to a great extent to destroy Christianity. And we didn't even realize it. We just sat there and laughed at the jokes. And a lot of it was jokes about Christianity. Watch today. See if you will find anything on television that speaks in a derogatory way of homosexuals and homosexuality. You won't find it, basically. How long will it take you to find someone or some show speaking derogatorily of Christianity, though? It won't take you very long because shows are filled with it. Why? Because they are advancing a, a philosophy upon man that says, leave God and come to the world. We come out of it. Where is our standard? In every aspect of our life, what standard do we follow? Do we follow the standard set by the world and have a love for the world and the things of the world? Or do we love God and the things of God? 
which one do we allow to set our standards of right and wrong? The Christian is that one who has come out of the world and is not going to be following the ways of the world. He's no longer going to be following the standards that it sets. He's no longer going to find his love in the world and the things of the world. He's not going to be the friend of the world. He has come out of those things and he's now dedicated and consecrated himself to be that Christian nation and to follow God in everything that God says. How? By his obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That gospel calls us, yes, to come out of the world and come into Christ and show forth the praises of him who hath called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Because we set a standard of Christianity now and we show forth within our life to the lost and dying world the example of Christ. Not the false view of the world that it presents of Christianity and of Christ, but the true view that God presents of Christianity. In all of that beauty and loveliness, the joy and the peace, the purpose in life that Christianity gives called and translated out of the world of darkness into the light of his dear son. If you have not obeyed that gospel of Jesus Christ this morning, we would encourage you to submit to the will of God. Do his will. Come out of this world of darkness, no longer love it. That's what repentance is all about. Based upon our belief that yes, God is, that Jesus is God's Son, that He died for our sins, we repent. We make that decision. I'm no longer going to live by that standard of the world. I'm going to be God's. But I'm still in the world, even though I've made the decision I don't want to be this way any longer. I'm going to be and I want to live the way of God. I've now got to change my state. I changed the attitude, but my state needs to be changed. It needs to be changed from being outside of Christ to being in Christ. Remember, we are a peculiar people and what that attitude expresses. We were in this kingdom, this kingdom of the darkness. We want to get into that kingdom of his dear son. We want to get in Christ where we belong now to him. That action is found in the action of baptism. And in that act of baptism, we're being baptized into Christ. We were in the world. We're changing the state to now being in Christ at that act of baptism. So if you have not obeyed that gospel of Jesus Christ and being baptized for the remission of your sins, we would encourage you to do that this morning. If you have become a Christian, but you've allowed the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life to come in and to take control of your life once again. And maybe you've brought reproach upon the church and upon the name of Jesus Christ. Then we can continue to confess our sins and a public confession of wrong might be necessary to repent of those sins that you commit. And then once again live for him in the ways in which he is set forth. If you need to come this morning, we encourage you to come and be saved. Have that eternal salvation as we stand and sing this invitation song.